Well, one of the things in risk assessment, there's such a thing called a, a risk framework. And one of the things is that um, the public policy response has to be such that a, a, a lot of what we, what we define as fat tail risks, which are risks that aren't expected to happen, nevertheless, governments must be prepared for them. You don't wait till it happens. That's a reactive policy. Now, in the UK, we've got two sets of policies. The one regarding Brexit, which as well is, is entirely complex, and now we've got COVID. And both are not being um, done um, by the government in the best and optimal possible way, because politics um, comes into it. So, for example, in COVID, the government didn't do anything. Why? Because they looked at one model, and the model said that they want, as I told you on the last program, that they wanted to go for herd immunity, to wait until 70% of the population have got it. So they waited. And that wait time cost lives. It's quite straightforward. Um, a simulation was done at Columbia University in New York, and it was found that um, had on the 8th of March Donald Trump played golf, had he instead said, right, shut down for the whole of the US, had he done that, 36,000 lives would have been saved. And in the UK, we're a smaller country, obviously, we're one-eighth the size of the US, but we've had an incredibly um, bad COVID. We haven't had supplies of masks, for example, because of the Brexit situation, Britain never participated in buying masks. And if you look at the number of casualties, a lot of it happened from frontline people. So in short, the government weren't in a position where they could actually mitigate the risks that occurred. And no one's asking them to forecast this, but you've always got to be ready with supply chains, ready to distribute kit, gear to the front line. Testing regimes, as I said before, is a critical factor to make people comfortable to go back to the market. You can only open up markets when people feel safe. And people right now don't feel safe. And I said that in Wuhan, when China opened up, people didn't go buying. So sales are down very sharply and have hardly improved. In the US, on the other hand, where they also opened up, um, it, it, it basically has led to more infections. And if there are more infections, there are going to be more deaths. So hospitals can, um, you know, not be able to absorb all those people in the ICU. And the other point is, if people fear what's going to happen, they're not going to go and shop and everything. So the link between this idea of flattening the curve and between testing regimes to give confidence actually are the things that will be critical in driving economic growth in these countries. I believe economic growth is going to be much slower, um, already forecast by the OECD of both Europe in the EU and the United States and the UK, um, are like minus 10%. I think it could be much worse than that, not because I'm a pessimist and I'm hoping I'm wrong. This is a case where I'm not a forecaster. But then it's got that we'll just recover the following year, 2021. And I think that's a mistake. It's a lack of understanding of people's confidence. It's a lack of understanding of investment in physical infrastructure, investment spending, and, um, and um, so on. Thank you, Colin. Thank you. Yeah, Thank okay. you. Thank I'd you. like to I'd pass, like on, to to pass Christian, on to Christian, because, because obviously your speciality, your human risk, um, it's analyzing what people, what the results would be if people do something that they shouldn't and vice versa, which makes it very interesting. Have we, are we still with um, Christian right now? I'm still here. Yes, you're still here, that's good, that's good. Um, we, we saw, uh, we spoke earlier today, um, and I sent you the article where some football fans here locally, that was uh, an example of people behaving perhaps as they shouldn't. Um, what's your analysis of that, Christian? Look, I, I think clearly what's very interesting about the virus is it is spread by people. 
And so, in, so we've got a, a, an interesting challenge here, which is we need to influence human decision making. And we need to get people to behave in a way that is totally different to the way they normally behave. And that feels very strange and is very difficult. And there are influences on that that mean it's not just a case of saying to people, do this. Because we are influenced by our own perceptions. We're influenced by the behavior of others. We get carried away if we're in a group setting. And so what, we, what we're being asked to do here is a, is a huge challenge to our normal ways of existing. We are so, we're naturally social. We, we like to engage with other people. Um, we don't like the idea of being spied upon. And, be, and so there are lots of things that we see people being asked to do that go against the grain of the way we normally behave. And so what we're running globally is, is the, probably the biggest behavioral experiment ever, which is how do we get people to fundamentally change the way that they behave? And I think one of the things we have to realize is that people are not just going to sit there and do what they're told. There will be influences at play. So if you perceive, for example, that lots of other people are breaking the rules, you are likely to break the rules yourself because you'll look at it and say, well, if it's good enough for them, why am I not doing the same thing? And so one of the really interesting things is there is a contagion issue around behavior as well. And so if we see lots of other people doing things, and clearly what's presented in the media is often not necessarily representative. We will see examples of people doing things they shouldn't, because that's an interesting media story. And it's very difficult for the media to film people being well-behaved, because being well-behaved means doing the right thing, uh, potentially staying at home. Um, or, you know, it's a bit dull, respecting social distancing. That's not a story. So what happens is the media and social media focuses on when people are doing the wrong thing. And that gives us the wrong impression about what's happening. And so there's a real risk here that, that behavioral contagion, i.e. we copy what other people do. And so when governments are trying to work out how to control and influence the population the right way, there are really subtle signals that we all take from each other. So if we don't trust the government, if we see other people breaking the rules or behaving in a certain way, then there is a big risk that we do the same thing. And that's a natural phenomenon that we have. So what's really interesting here is that what the governments and authorities are trying to manage is a huge behavioral challenge. And you have to think very carefully about how messages are transmitted. And of course, you can't influence the entire message. You, the governments can transmit messages through the official channels. But we all look and see what's going on around us. We all focus on social media and on traditional media. And that will be sending us certain signals about what's going on. And we'll be making our own minds up about it. So this is a really, really complicated and, from my perspective, fascinating challenge. Yes. What do you think about this, uh, Professor Fenech, about what the gentlemen are saying? Well, <clears throat> I, I, I completely agree with him. I, I was touched, though, with, with a, a plaque that was in one of the uh, World War cemeteries saying they gave up their day for our tomorrow, and which is basically what we're asking people to do, to give up a few days, and uh, I know it's gone on to a few weeks now, so that tomorrow will be there. And to see people behaving in a way that's completely different to what uh, every single country is talking about uh, mm. social distancing. Absolutely. Is, is very sad. It is, it's something. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lawrence. Thank you very much for joining us. Anyway, I think um, what, uh, it was very interesting. I mean, I yes. know you're very interested in the, in the it, risk it, assessments. It, it, what, from, what, what's, what's your, what are your thoughts about it? From an anthropological point of view, we're a tribal society. So the whole reason, perhaps, why we have been successful is because we operate as a tribe. Now, currently, we have our old people who have been in for a very long time. And thankfully, we've not had an epidemic there because, because the, the, the problems in Bergamo and, and, uh, and the UK where care homes lost as many as 50% of their uh, population are very well known. So, so typically, we have always uh, you know, look, looked after our elderly because we're a caring society. But this um, tribal mentality, as we see in a football crowd, um, we know that the Torino, for example, started off with Juventus, with the Juventus game. Um, anyway, we, we, at this point in time, the assessments of the professors are absolutely right. Uh, the testing, I think, is, 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 is essential, but testing also has evolved. We are now into what's called CRISPR technology. We can detect the virus very easily. And in antibody testing, which is much more sophisticated than the, the kits were. It is possible now to test people and cautiously, for example, open airports. We all remember when we used to go abroad that you had to have your shots or if you have to bring pets over, you've got to be careful about rabies. So I, I think with a certain amount of science in 
there in place, we can cautiously start to open the taps, even when it comes to our biggest challenge. Uh, but it's our raison d'etre as well, our international travel and international trade, which up to now people have not been considering, um, considering very carefully. And, and it is not an argument uh, between wealth, health and wealth. I, I do not like the term. I think it's <coughs> between health and food on your table, basically. I think this and is, this is the argument. And also, I think it's also putting things into perspective. The yeah. Italian data that came out yesterday, uh, yeah. this morning, showed that 95% uh, of the people who died of COVID had pre-existing conditions, the conditions we've been talking about. And it's only 4 point something percent of people who didn't have any conditions who actually died. So we do have to look after the people who have pre-existing conditions. And God yes. knows there's enough of those over yes. there. Yes. So, I mean, uh, the idea is that vulnerable people yes. need to stay mm. in on strict lockdown yeah. for much longer. Yeah. But, but, but I don't believe that mm. everyone's observing that, really. Yeah. No, but, the, but, but that's the problem of seeing these football fans going... I mean, they all went back home to their elderly parents, yes. uh, uh, who, in all probability, have some kind of morbidity uh, there. Mm. And that's very sad. 